Hi, I'm Theo, and this is Adorno. He's a cat, and he's also joining this lecture. It's kind of a strange situation for me, because this is the absolute last day I'm working at the Maastricht Institute of Arts. And this is your first day, so it is kind of weird. As I already mentioned, I'm Theo. I'm a sociologist, and that means that I kind of study how developments in society change the way we behave, and also change society itself. At the moment I have a company, Studio Hyperspace, and at Studio Hyperspace I'm studying the future. So I'm not studying society as it is at the moment, but I'm kind of exploring the way that the accelerating world at the moment is developing. And I'm kind of making scenarios for 2030 or even uh, further away. I also founded Speculative Futures Amsterdam. That's a part of an international network of speculative future platforms. And in Amsterdam, we study how speculative design, and I'm going to dive into speculative design later, uh, is a very interesting tool to explore the future. So, enough about me. Um, let's dive into uh, the topic of today. And the topic of today is how the uh, world at the moment is changing and how you as an artist or designer can keep track and can also have a meaningful uh, role in that changing and accelerating world. Before we start, shout out to all the people living in Brunsum, uh, because it's kind of the, well, <laughs> on one hand, the worst place to live and grow up, but on the other hand, it's also quite nice. Um, and I think it's um, a good idea to use the chat on the right, or the comment section below. I don't know how YouTube will uh, show this lecture, to type in questions. So this is pre-recorded, but I'll be also be there live. Uh, so if you have questions, um, then just um, put them in the comments and I'll react to it. And you can put your questions there or your comments or other stuff you want to share in uh, German, uh, in English, of course, and in Dutch, and also in the language of the cats, <laughs> right, because everybody kind of understands that language. So, let's start. I want to take you back to 1985 um, with this big event. It was called the uh, Live Aid event. And the goal was to raise... So, that's when cats kind of behave as they do. <laughs> let's start over. <laughs> Adorno is gone. Bye, Adorno. Okay, back to 1985. Uh, with uh, the Live Aid event. I was very young back then, um, but I also watched this live event broadcasted around the whole world with millions and millions of other people. And we saw concerts by bands like Queen, uh, U2, Deepesh Mode, uh, David Bowie. And the goal was to raise money for um, uh, hunger in Africa. But I think the whole idea was much bigger. The whole idea was to uh, make people aware that uh, although we were living in a society that was highly modern with all things you could imagine, that there was still hunger in the world. And the idea was, okay, let's end it now. And all those big artists uh, said, okay, let's do this. And all the people that watched also said, okay, let's do this. I mean, we can do it. It's kind of what Obama later used as, yes, we can. Uh, in the 1980s, we already used that. I don't know, come up. Yeah, okay. Hmm. So don't mess it up again. <laughs> so, what happened? Mm, I mean, I have to admit that I was more interested in the bands um, than in kind of the, the whole package. Uh, but I certainly felt it. And... Um, well, uh, you have to imagine there was no internet, so the day after we spoke at school uh, about um, hunger in the world and we all said, okay, 
this has to end. Um, and we kind of were positive that it um, would end because it was such a big life event. So fast forward to 2017. These are the figures of hunger in the world. And um, well, just believe me, um, there is at this moment more hunger, uh, well, um, um, more than twice uh, the amount than it was in 1985. So uh, I think at this moment we are living in a really complex time with a lot of things that we don't understand. Maybe also we've kind of have the idea we lost control. So I want to raise uh, four questions um, for this lecture. And these are the four. So, um, well, I just said we are kind of living in a time where a lot of things are happening and we think we don't have control. Uh, well, is that actually the case? And isn't it the case that we, as humans, always think that we are living in times that are uh, not controllable, very complicated, blah, blah, blah. Um, and how can we understand these times? Are there kind of ideas, philosophies uh, that we can use to get a better understanding of what is happening right now? And if we have that understanding, we can also kind of think about the role of the artist and the designer. And at the end, uh, I'll uh, give you some examples of practices in art and design that are already kind of using that a new understanding of the world. So, let's get to it. At this moment, we have a time that is kind of different than times before. I mean, of course, around 1900, there was also the idea that uh, the world was accelerating, that people didn't really understand what was happening. You got the Industrial Revolution, of course. Um, people moved to cities instead of living um, uh, in kind of small villages. Um, and the whole kind of landscape uh, in the world changed. Um, also, because we invented the idea of the nation state, like the Netherlands or France uh, or the United States, Germany. That's kind of a recent phenomenon. And that eventually uh, accumulated into the First World War. So at this moment, people are also uh, talking about uh, big changes, an accelerating world, uh, a lot of things that we don't kind of understand. And I think that feeling is kind of true. One of the main uh, indicators of that is um, the way that globalization and also, of course, the internet has made sure that we know what is happening all over the world. So in my kind of social media feed, I don't only see these things that are happening, um, well, around the block or uh, for me in Eindhoven because I live at Stripe S. Um, but we also see at the same time what is happening in uh, Santiago in Chile, uh, or in the United States, or in Russia, uh, or in Berlin, or in the Middle East. And we have kind of the tendency to have an opinion about that, uh, because it's quite difficult for us as people to not get involved with things we see. We have to kind of relate to it. And that makes this time very complicated, because there are so many impulses from all over the world. Then, of course, we have also our production system that not only produces a lot of goods that are really nice to, to use, like coffee machines or uh, bikes or books or clothing, uh, but on the other hand also um, produces a, a lot of waste. And that waste leads to problems, like the plastic soup, for example. And, um, I mean, it has gone a bit out of hand. I don't think, well, maybe I shouldn't have said this, but the breakfast you are eating at the moment is full of microplastics. I mean, you can't see them because they are really, really tiny, but you are eating it. And don't stop eating. I mean, just <laughs> uh, finish your breakfast because I think it's better to die with a full stomach than of course to die of hunger, but it is a problem. I mean, we have to face this, but we don't know how to do it because we are stuck in this kind of uh, production system. And that production system also leads to climate change. Well, that's not exactly true, of course. The climate changes. Um, 
and that's not dependent on us, but we kind of are accelerating uh, that change by the way we behave. And that leads to a lot of problematic situations. Mm, at this moment, not really in the Netherlands, but mm, there are, of course, maps of, uh, that show the Netherlands in, for example, 2050, um, where Amsterdam doesn't exist anymore. That's not a real big problem, although I also work in Amsterdam, so hmm, could be a problem for me. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think I'll be alive in 2050, so okay, uh, that's for me too far away. But <laughs> of course, in other parts of the world, it already is a problem. Um, for example, the forest fires in Australia and also in California, um, and also the floods that are, have become already quite normal in the south of the United States, but also in Asia. What we do feel in the Netherlands and in Europe is the refugee crisis. Um, refugees coming from all parts of, um, of the world to Europe, because in Europe it's of course a life that is better than they have, but also because they can't stay anymore at the places where they are born, due to climate change, due to wars, etc. etc. And it is becoming a problem that we can't manage. And yeah, maybe there is no solution, but it kind of feeds the idea we don't have control anymore about what is happening in the world. There are also more and more people revolting to the government. This is a, an image of a revolt in Chile, uh, in Santiago, the, the main capital in Chile. Um, and they are already protesting since November 2019. And it still goes on and on and on. It doesn't kind of reach the headlines of the newspapers anymore, while well, it doesn't reach the newspapers in Europe anymore. But they are still going on and going on. And they are not satisfied with the government, they won't change, etc. And the government represses it with a lot of brutal violence. And then we, of course, have also our own protests, like the Black Lives Matter protest. Also very interesting because uh, in Europe especially it's fueled by things that we saw uh, happening in the United States. So that is an indication how small our world has, has become. I mean, things that happen on the other side of the world have a direct effect on what we are doing. We also uh, suffer under, under the COVID-19 um, situation. So we had a lockdown, now we are kind of, in the Netherlands at least, free to move, uh, but we have to keep uh, one meter and a half distance to people, and it is becoming kind of a big discussion. We also, and I think this is essential to what is happening in the world right now, we also uh, see that uh, our scientists don't know what is happening exactly. So they give a lot of kind of information. They also say, okay, maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that, but we don't know for sure. And that's interesting because we used to live in a society where we thought, as a society but also as an individual, that scientists are always right and know how the world functions. So now we are confronted with a totally different situation where nobody really knows what is happening and what is the best to do. And that's interesting, because that also fuels conspiracy theories. Uh, like these two girls, I think they are no, maybe your age, and they believe in the idea that Bill Gates, um, well, it's an interesting conspiracy theory, that Bill Gates wants to raise more money by inventing a vaccine um, and uh, give everybody a chip. Uh, well, quite difficult to explain, but I have an image and it's over here uh, without Bill Gates in uh, this case, but um, there is kind of a connection between 5G, uh, bats that are also weaponized, chemtrails, uh, COVID-19, the new world order and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so maybe I'm a sheeple, but <laughs> well, this goes a bit too far. But I kind of, as a sociologist, understand why people think that these conspiracy theories are uh, maybe right, because uh, nobody can give a good explanation. 
and the world has become really complicated. So people are looking for control and are looking for stories that uh, give meaning to what they already thought maybe about the world. So if you already thought that maybe the government or other people are suppressing you, then this is a really good uh, way to deal with that uncontrollable situation. Now, all of a sudden, you have an explanation, you have a story. So, well, we can kind of condemn conspiracy theory thinkers, but maybe they are smarter than us because we are just, well, yeah, sheeple. What can we do uh, to get our control back? That's a difficult question. Because I don't think we can go back to the modern approach of, okay, let's rationalize everything, let's make kind of objective ideas, let's put them into a document and then it's fixed. Because I already showed you that back in 1985, making a document that says no hunger anymore doesn't really work. So what to do? I have an idea. Let's go look at popular culture, because I think that popular culture is always kind of a good representation of what is happening around the world. And I want to tell you uh, the story behind the movie Snowpiercer by the South Korean uh, producer Bong Joon-ho from 2013. Actually, the story is based on a comic book, a French comic book from the 1980s, and it's about, um, well, the world we have now that is in a, um, a situation where the climate uh, change has become so invasive and so um, problematic for people that there is kind of a new ice age around the world. So we can't live anymore on this earth because it's too cold. But a couple of people, maybe the Bill Gateses of the world, um, have of course already thought about this. They made a train that is able to perpetually move around the world for ages and ages until the world is habitable uh, again. And uh, people are selected to uh, live in this train. So at the beginning of the movie, uh, I believe that people are already 83 years in the train. So nobody really experienced uh, the world before because the oldest person, the train already died. Uh, so everybody's born in this train. And this train is kind of a representation of our current society. Where there are classes, um, where people live, and the place that you are born in the train also dictates um, what kind of privilege you have and what position you have. And in this train, a really kind of weird micro society exists. Where everybody says, okay, we are living in this train and this is our world. We can't go outside because it's too cold, we'll die. So we have to put up with the situation that we are on this train. And everybody's kind of pay, uh, doing their role in this train. And it's really violent, uh, it's not uh, pleasant for most people, but everybody is just kind of aware of the situation. While a couple of people, well actually one, uh, has the idea that you have to look somewhere else. Namely, not the situation in the train, because um, the situation in the train is for nobody kind of a really good situation. You have to look kind of outside, you have to get out of the train. But the rest of the people, uh, of course, didn't, uh, don't get that idea to look outside of the train. So this metaphor, I think, is really strong. At the end of the movie, no, 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 I'm not going to spoil anything. No, no, no. So the metaphor is really strong. I mean, this is our society. And if you look at our society within kind of the structures of the society we have created, you'll never find an answer. Um, you have to look outside of the train. You have to see both the train and the outside world to really understand what is happening. And also, you have to understand that uh, there is an outside of the train, um, and you have kind of find you have to find ways to tell that to the people in the train. Really complicated, but I think that this is a really good metaphor uh, of what is happening 
at the moment in our world also. A couple of examples. In the Declaration of Human Rights, it said in Article 5 that uh, nobody should be enslaved. That's interesting. And it's kind of in line with uh, what I already told about 1985. And also in line with what is happening in the train. There is kind of a structure in the train, there are kind of rules. Everybody should have a good life, etc. But in reality, in the train, nobody has. Or a couple of people uh, have a good life, but uh, the majority doesn't. And that's the same in our world. Although we have this uh, Declaration of Human Rights and everybody uh, thinks that um, nobody needs to be enslaved, we kind of mm, use slaves in our daily practice. The people uh, that make our clothing, for example, or the people that uh, make our electronic equipment. Even more extreme, people that um, dive into uh, these kind of holes in the world to get the minerals and metals um, that are really important to make our electronic equipment. And they work for 20 hours and are used as slaves. So slavery isn't uh, something that you can get rid of by just make a declaration and everybody saying, okay, um, we think this is a good declaration, let's do it. Uh, you have to put it into practice. And our reality is a totally different one from uh, the things that we think are important in our world. That's the same with the idea that we uh, think that we have to live in harmony with nature. That's of course a thing that nobody would kind of uh, deny. Um, but still, we are slaughtering 3 billion animals. 3 billion! I mean, how much is that for food each day? day. It's not a year, but it's the day. So, well, I don't think you can say that we are kind of living in harmony with nature with our dry eyes. So what to do? That's interesting. Um, because why is this happening? I mean, how can we kind of understand a world that is so kind of, well, excuse me, fucked up? Let's take a look at a couple of theories that maybe can help us to get a different perspective on what is happening at the moment. One of the most used metaphors is, of course, the metaphor that is used in the Matrix, um, where Neo is offered a blue pill and a red pill. And if you take a red pill, you are woke. And you can be woke on the right side, on the left side, on the no side, but this implicates that there is kind of a difference between the reality we are living in um, and, uh, well, the other way around, the illusion that we are living in, the system that we uh, have made, the train, you could say, and reality, where the train doesn't exist, but where the train is just in our heads. I don't think that this metaphor is a useful one, because it kind of uh, introduces a controversy between two things that isn't there. And I'm not the only one that is thinking that. Also, the Slovenian philosopher, well, superstar philosopher, Slavo Žižek, thinks in this way. So, let's hear what he has to say about uh, the metaphor of the blue and the red pill. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. But the choice between the blue and the red pill is not really a choice between illusion and reality. Of course, Matrix is a machine for fictions, but these are fictions which already structure our reality. If you take away from our reality the symbolic fictions that regulate it, you lose reality itself. I want a third pill. A third pill. And I think uh, Zizek is right here. I mean, 
uh, there is no choice between, on one hand, the society we have, and on the other hand, a totally different society. Because we live in the society we already have. And we can't change this um, dramatically uh, within a second in something completely different. All kinds of social interaction, all things we do, uh, are based on this system. So we have to really understand this system and see the truth or the reality in that system itself. And that could kind of solve the idea um, that we uh, get our control back of our society. So I think that Zizek's third pill is a really good metaphor for a different way of looking at what is happening at the moment. And you can also see this in this train. So if you would kind of think in the woke idea of the red pill, you would say, okay, uh, the train doesn't exist. So if the train doesn't exist, you can go wherever you want. But in reality, the train is there. So you cannot unthink it because it's there. And all the other people are living in this train. So if you want everybody kind of to understand that reality can be something different than uh, living in this train, you have to accept that the train is there. And use the train, of course, also as a metaphor to um, convince people that there was also a life outside of this train. So the life outside of the train is only there when you, of course, also see this train. So you have to have both. And that's kind of the third pill uh, that Zizek is talking about. Another really cool metaphor, well, at least that's what I think, is the Baroque Sunbursts by Frederick Jameson. He's a sociologist, really famous one, who writes really interesting books. Um, maybe you can read some if you are interested in this. Um, but he is talking about the idea that uh, although we are living in a world that is kind of complicated and complex, etc., sometimes we see kind of rays of light uh, coming into uh, the world we are living in. And those rays of, rays of light are kind of a metaphor for things that are uh, not in line with uh, the system and the world we are living in. And they are showing us different things, things that are also there and can also happen. So I think this is a really interesting metaphor because it shows us that there is no, not one world. I mean, there are a couple of alternative worlds that, ha that are existing at the same time. So now we have kind of an idea how we could understand these times better. Namely, not by uh, dividing it into good or bad, but by dividing it into uh, an idea that there is kind of a way of understanding these times by taking um, the essence of the world we are living in as a basis. So what can a designer do to show this, for example, to other people? Well, let's have a look. Of course, we can talk about art um, for days, maybe for weeks, maybe for years. Um, so I know this is really brief, but I think it's necessary to give a couple of examples of artists that tried to let us, normal people, uh, see the world in a totally different way. One of the examples is, of course, the uh, skull by Damien Hirst. Uh, it's a skull laid with diamonds. It's worth millions. And his idea, idea was to show us how our capitalistic system works. Um, interesting piece of art. Um, and you have to go to a museum to see it. The same goes for uh, the painting that is uh, ripped up by Banksy. It's also a piece of art that shows us something, that shows us what art is really kind of about. It's not about the piece of art itself, but it's about the idea. But it is a piece that is also um, situated in a museum. And both are um, quite, um, well, recent. So Banksy really recent, and the uh, skull by Damien Hirst is a couple of decades old. Uh, but they use kind of the exactly same principles as uh, 
Duchamp used with his fountain in 1917. He kind of uses uh, the laws of, uh, that are applicable in the art world and turn them around. Um, and then you get kind of a piece of art that is so kind of different that people kind of have to give a reaction to it and have to relate to it. But the interesting thing is all these three uh, end up in a museum. In a museum, uh, in, well, the Banksy is, uh, in this case, of course, not on a white wall, but in a museum with white walls, um, away from society itself, because it's in a museum. And then art is something that is, uh, of course, a part of society itself, but in a specific kind of situation. These artworks uh, are brilliant, but they don't have the impact that you have to have as an artist, because in the end, it will not change anything. It's like the Declaration uh, of Human Rights. It's like, um, well, the concert Life Aid in 1985. It's a really interesting gesture. People will think for a couple of moments that the world could be different than it is, and the next day it's business as usual. So this has to be something else if you want to be an artist that has an impact on the world. In design, that kind of notion is already kind of entering uh, the realm of design. Um, last year, the um, uh, inventor of the retweet on Twitter uh, said that he never should have uh, invented that uh, and introduced it to Twitter because the retreat uh, has a um, effect on the long term um, and an effect that makes the world more kind of itchy, polarized, uh, in conflict. So he also said, okay, um, this is like uh, handing a loaded gun to a four-year-old. The same goes for the inventor on Instagram of the eternal scroll. So instead of always kind of uh, clicking next page, you now can kind of scroll eternally um, uh, and see um, uh, with every scroll something new. And that also has an effect on the long term that um, is negative because um, you always think that the next scroll will give you something that is better than you've already seen. And that leads to the, the, the kind of behavior of the eternal scroll. You can't stop scrolling and it doesn't give you a good feeling. So this designer said, okay, I should not have invented this. Hmm, interesting. It was early in the 1990s that Dick Buchanan, a professor at a business school, um, thought about these kind of things. So nearly uh, 20 years before these things happened. Well, 20 years, huh, 30 years. He said, every object that we make, everything that people make, has kind of three layers. Namely, the thing itself, um, the product, the artwork, uh, the design. Uh, it can also be, of course, kind of a habit, a way of doing things. Then there is um, uh, the second level where um, that kind of product or that idea is used, uh, that people are using it, that's the experience. Then people will kind of change their behavior on the basis of the things we have invented. And then, and that's kind of the step that is mostly kind of um, uh, still not really used, is the step of the system. So eventually, if everybody uh, is using a product in a certain way, it will change our society because we are kind of um, uh, creating a new way of doing things. One of the examples could be, for example, the internet uh, that was invented. Uh, then people uh, were using it in a specific way and now it has changed society because everybody now knows what is happening all around the world. And that makes us uh, um, doing stuff in a totally different way. So that's kind of the, uh, the complex way in which the things that we are uh, using 
um, change our society. And that also means that this, for example, waste, this is kind of an integral part of the design process itself. Um, so if you design something from, for example, plastic, uh, and you know how people will use it, then eventually you can kind of already, uh, in the early stage, know that this will be the effect of the things you are producing. I don't think it's that easy, um, especially this is kind of in hindsight. We now know that we have kind of all this plastic waste. Um, and I don't think that people in the 1960s would really kind of uh, um, uh, knew that we um, um, would have those kind of big um, plastic soups. But I think it's an interesting notion. So I transformed it into my three M's. Uh, that I'm also using in my practice uh, because, well, I think this is a bit kind of easier um, where uh, we always look at developments or services or products in these kind of three stages. And we are really interesting, uh, interested in the macro level. So uh, if we do something, if we design uh, something, if we make an artwork, what will be the transformational value? What will be the effect on society and the world? And how will it change our values? And this is in line with the medium is a message by Marshall McLuhan. Don't know if you know him. If you don't know him, read his book. Uh, the medium is the massage. So not the message, but the massage. It's a really good book. Um, it's also full of pictures, so it's not that kind of difficult. And he's already kind of talking about the idea that every kind of invention that we make, because uh, for Marshall McLuhan, every uh, thing that we as a human produce uh, that can be physical or non-physical is a medium, um, that the message of such a medium is the effect that um, the thing will have on our society. One example that McLuhan is using is uh, the car, um, where the invention of the car led to cities that were uh, eventually made for uh, driving a car with big lanes where children couldn't play anymore, etc. Uh, so that kind of tiny idea of introducing a car in society has an enormous effect on how society looks like in uh, decades after the first uh, introduction of the invention. That's also the basis of uh, the idea of speculative design. I've already mentioned it in my introduction. Uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, speculative design, but it was kind of introduced in 2013 by Fiona Rabbi and Anthony Dunn. They, at that time, both, both worked at the uh, Royal Academy of Arts in London. And um, they first introduced the idea of critical design, and then they came up with this book, Speculative Everything, where they pinpoint speculative design as kind of more, much more a way to debate um, what is happening in the world right now and what the implications are of the things that we are producing, of the design and the artworks we are making. And they think that design, but also art, uh, could have a specific role in helping us debating what kind of future we want to have. So they are really focused on technology, but I think that technology isn't that um, interesting because mostly uh, the kind of cultural and social, um, um, all the cultural and social aspects of a technology are changing society itself. We'll see that in um, a couple of moments. So we can use speculative design to look at the future in a different way than we normally do. This is the future cone by Voros, and it's mostly used to uh, look at the near future. Normally that's done uh, by, for example, future studies or scenario uh, thinking. And if we think about the world that we already have, then you get a projected future. So 
you think about how the world is already functioning, you are kind of extrapolating that to the near future, and then you have kind of the plausible projected future. It's like being in that train and seeing that train uh, as the limit of your society. So you will always think about the future in that train. So that's kind of a scenario of future thinking. What speculative thinking is doing is something completely different. So speculative thinking is thinking in uh, another status quo. It's saying, okay, the world as it is now, so the train, can also be something else. It shouldn't um, have to be that train. It can also be um, um, a totally other structure. And from that structure, you are thinking about how the world could kind of look if we now adapt that kind of a new structure. So that uh, sounds quite abstract at this moment. I'll give an example. Um, but before I give the example, I think it's important to also notice that speculative design is um, mostly used to come up with preferable futures. So futures, you also say, okay, I really want this future. It's kind of the future I want to happen. So an example, if you would use scenario studies um, and you, for example, want to change sustainability uh, or you have to, if you want to do something that is sustainable, then you will end up with the electric car. Because in the society we have, in the system we have, the car is the basic way of transportation. So you just take that and make something new out of it. Um, that is kind of really reassembling the car as it already is, with the roads, with the infrastructure, etc., etc. So you just make that electric. If you think um, in a speculative design way, you would come up with a totally different idea. I'm not giving an example in the future because that's really difficult. Um, you have to kind of really think about it, but I can give you an example of the past. For example, moving around in the city. Instead of uh, coming up with um, things that are already there, you can also think about a moving sidewalk. So that's a totally different way of looking at how transportation in the city could take place. And you just get rid of uh, the cars. And that's also what Frederick Pohl in this um, quote means. Um, a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but also the traffic jam. And I think that not, not only goes for science fiction, but also for design and art. You should kind of have an idea what, what you are inventing uh, has uh, for consequences. One example that is uh, really interesting is that uh, there is that Netflix documentary about the first undergrounds, the first, first metros in the United States in the early 1900s. Um, and the problem that uh, the big cities like, for example, Chicago and New York had at that time was, huh, and you won't believe it, horse shit. Because all the transportation in the city center was, was done by horses. And um, the stench was enormous. Uh, there was a lot of kind of um, poop everywhere. And um, that was kind of the main problem that cities had. So they kind of assembled, assembled a lot of kind of bright minds and they came up with all those brilliant ideas of, for example, roads that would kind of uh, be able to collapse. So all the shit would kind of fall down and then the road would fall again uh, and all kinds of that kind of th things. But 10 years later, the whole problem wasn't there anymore. Why? Because other people um, invented the underground. <laughs> so the total means of transportation just moved from horses to using the underground. So the whole problem wasn't there anymore. And that's, I think, the difference between thinking in a speculative way and thinking in a kind of um, future scenario way. It's the difference between living and thinking in the train or seeing the train from a distance and knowing that the train can also be something else. 
So what have we done? Uh, we've looked at uh, the role that designers can play and we've looked at um, how designers can use, for example, speculative thinking, speculative design and art to come up with uh, different uh, approaches to the problems we have at the moment. So are there already practices of those arts and designs? Yes, there are. I'm going to show you three. First of all, of course, new aesthetic and vaporwave. I know vaporwave has already transformed in hot wave and other um, uh, sorts of vapor um, and wave, of course. But I think this is a really important phenomenon in art, um, especially also new aesthetics that kind of embraces the um, uh, idea that technology and especially digital technology isn't perfect. So why is vaporwave so important? For one, because it's a virus on the internet. It didn't kind of um, uh, evolve from the normal art scene. It isn't something that has been seen in museum. It's an art form, it's a pop culture form that evolved on the internet. And it's really interesting because the song you're hearing right now, and please put in the comments what you're hearing right now because I know that a lot of, of you know this song, has been uh, listened to on YouTube, for example, way, way, way more than uh, the most streamed song on Spotify. But nobody knows, uh, well, most people don't know this song, but it is much bigger. And I think this is kind of using the power of the network instead of the power of the hierarchy. It isn't important anymore that everybody knows what you're doing. Um, or, mm, that's not kind of what I meant. Mm, I meant this. It's not important that the mainstream media um, writes about you or um, thinks that you're important. <laughs> that is totally uh, not interesting anymore. It's and I say, in the Netherlands, for example, of the New York Times, write writing about your artwork because the effect of your artwork is not uh, directly linked to those mainstream old uh, publications. Things are happening in the network, and not only on the internet, but also um, with other people. And I think that's the way that you as an artist or designer can uh, bring meaning to this world and can have a much bigger effect than just make hard words for Museia that are being reviewed in the big newspapers. The second um, example is Veja. Um, already exists for 15 years and you, I think, know the brand because at this moment everybody's wearing Vegas, but for the last 15 years they have been trying to change the production chain of shoes um, and making every aspect of the production chain more sustainable, giving people uh, that, for example, are making the shoes uh, a good loan but also uh, give the people where they buy, for example, the rubber for the sales, um, a good price for it. Um, making the shoes also sustainable. And they have been doing this for 15 years. And I'm so happy that now uh, this brand has become so big as it is, because this should be the standard. Um, and uh, this should be kind of the normal in the shoe industry and not uh, what, for example, Nike or Adidas are doing. Oh, sorry. An art project that I think it's really interesting and it's in line with uh, speculative thinking is this uh, project by Frank Kolkman. Frank Kolkman won the Young Dutch Design Award in 2018 um, um, with his projects and also uh, this project. It's a do-it-yourself surgical robot where Frank uh, in the beginning thought about how will our um, health uh, care change in the upcoming years when healthcare will become too expensive for most people to uh, buy. Uh, you see this already in the United States where some people aren't uh, capable of um, um, 
paying for a surgery um, because it has been too expensive and there is no kind of insurance. So they have to pay um, the surgeries themselves and they can't. So Frank thought about this and came up with the idea of a surgical robot that is quite kind of cheap, around 5,000 euros, and you can buy it um, as, for example, a city part or a street or something else, maybe as a network, and then you can uh, do the operations, the surgery yourself uh, with help of this robot, so you don't need that health healthcare anymore. Of course, Frank is not suggesting that this would be the best solution, but this is a project that makes you think about what the future of healthcare should be. And that's what Frank is kind of trying to achieve. And I think it's a success. The project Cow and Co by Anastasia Eckers and Anthony Ruder um, tries to uh, tell the story of uh, how we um, engage with animals, um, especially with the bio industry where uh, cows are used to produce, of course, a lot of milk. Um, and Cow and Co um, is an interesting project because it uh, uh, gives the lead to the cow. So the cow becomes an entrepreneur and the cow sells her own milk to you. So we've seen uh, a couple of best practices. Uh, there are a lot uh, uh, more, of course. Uh, if you know best practices or think, okay, I also know a really cool project, maybe it is also in the line of speculative design, please um, put it into the chat or into the comment section and maybe we can have a discussion about it. So I think the most important lesson is that you have to leave the train. I think that's it. Um, so we've seen that um, scientists, politicians, philosophers, the people uh, that kind of are in charge in our society at the moment don't have an answer to the big questions that we have in our system. So we as designers and artists have to kind of engage with this system and have to help people uh, give meaning to what is happening around us and maybe also lead the way to a better engaging future. So if you want to connect, um, well, I'm not on social media, well, on LinkedIn and Twitter, so maybe you can follow me there. Uh, but you can also go to studiohyperspace.net and uh, drop me a mail. And of course, if you have questions in the comment section or in the chat, um, if it's there. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, and I hope you have a great time at the Maastricht Institute of Arts and enjoy it. Okay, bye.